For more stories like these, go to www.social-tv.co.za, subscribe to us on YouTube and follow us on our social mediums. The Global Initiative to End Wildlife Crime has outlined an innovative One Health approach to reforming wildlife trade laws that the group said would help avoid future devastating wildlife-related pandemics. In other words, let's create laws that takes a look at illegal wildlife trade, where wildlife trade threatens human and animal health, stop such trade, close wildlife markets, and stem consumption. In order to make this happen, you need increased collaboration. We have a chat to the End Wildlife Crime Chair, John Scanlon, you're listening to me, Sam Marshall, on our social newscast brought to you by www.social-tv.co.za. John, very important announcement or program that you guys are, are interested in developing. Just explain to us, the layman, what is the One Health concept? So basically what we've come together to do is to, to push two objectives. One's for a wildlife crime agreement. Another is for amending wildlife trade laws to build in public and animal health into decision making. And in that context, we're talking about taking a one health approach, which is, means you look at environmental issues, public health issues and animal health issues all at one and the same time. So you make one decision taking all of those issues into consideration rather than looking at them separately and distinctly. John, how are you going to achieve that? If history has taught us anything that organizations like operating in silos unless you've got the will from all of those involved to really be able to tackle this issue is that not a difficult ask yeah it is i think it always is whether you're looking at a national international level you know we too often operate in silos and then people within that silo protect that silo but we're also seeing some shifts and we do see uh, changes both nationally and internationally when they're really needed. And here the concept of taking a One Health approach is already embedded into the World Health Organization, FAO and others. They're already acknowledging that this is an important uh, concept, but how do we move it from a concept and operationalize it? And in the world of wildlife trade, the best way to do that is to use the instrument that regulates wildlife trade, which at the international level is CITES, and build into that regime public and animal health into the decision-making process. Will it be challenging? Yes, it's always challenging to change uh, international laws. But if you look back in time, in the 1970s, the world came together to create CITES, the World Heritage Convention, the Convention on Wetlands. In the 90s, it did climate change biodiversity, desertification. In the early 2000s, it came up with conventions on you know, dealing with corruption and transnational organized crime. So when the international community wants to, it can do it. And now is the time to move in this post-COVID-19 uh, environment. But you must also admit, John, that we are living in a very different time. And I'm not just talking COVID, I'm talking politically as well. We've got leaders with very different ideological ideas we have got leaders who agree and disagree on certain aspects that are important to their country. How do you get across those divides to make sure that you've got an, an international framework, a legal framework that organizations, countries adhere to? A couple of things I'd say there. Firstly, if we cast our mind back to the 1970s, where we had the, you know, the UN uh, conference uh, in Stockholm on the human environment, the first time ever we had a conference on that in the early 1970s. Then we had the CITES Convention adopted World Heritage. That was at the height of the Cold War. The tensions at that stage were massive. But the international community nonetheless managed to coalesce around certain issues of common interest. And in that conservation space, we did see quite some movement at that time. If we look fast forward to today, there is some certain geopolitical you know, um, tensions around the place. But at the same time, the whole world is feeling the impact of this COVID-19 pandemic. Socially, economically, it's having a devastating effect. And there is a common interest in making sure we don't get exposed 
to new pandemics into the future because we know there are many other viruses that can spill over from animals into humans. So there is that issue of common interest here that can transcend some of these geopolitical issues, just have an international framework that's fit for purpose to make sure we're not being exposed to these type of pandemics into the future. So I do think historically the world's been able to get over geopolitical issues where there are critical issues of common interest. And I do think we've got uh, a situation today where this is of common interest, despite whatever other differences there may be. That situation with COVID really then gives you a fantastic argument. Do you think pre-COVID, pre this last five, six months, this was a, was a, a difficult argument to make? And now with COVID being here, you can say, well, here's a practical example of, of what we've been arguing for years. Yeah, I think the science has been telling us for a long time the risk of spillover from animals to humans, in particular from wild animals to humans. Uh, we did experience it in the past, for example, with SARS, um, and there were some moves after SARS, but that epidemic was brought under control. So um, the world did some things, but not, not really institutionalizing them. I think here this has been of such a scale, of such a magnitude, and has been so devastating that there's a recognition we do have to make some fundamental changes to our institutions that will survive over time to make sure that we do not expose ourselves to this in the, to, into the future, or at least do everything we can to avoid finding ourselves in a similar situation further down the track. In your recent memory, has there been an initiative on the size and scale of One Health has there been this amount of collaboration or talk about collaboration before? I think there's been a lot of talk about collaboration. So if you look at the discussions around the World Health Organization, FAO and others, there has been a discussion around One Health. There has been a discussion within the OIE, the World Animal Health Organization, around One Health, how you, how you, you know, advance it. But if you like, these things, they have a gestation period and they can go on and discussion and there can be some collaboration and and efforts, but when you hit a crisis, and we've confronted a, a global crisis with the COVID-19 pandemic, then I think politicians and citizens are saying, we need to act actually, we need to do something that's much more definitive here to make sure that the conditions that can lead to these sorts of pandemics um, uh, don't happen into the future. And that's where I think looking at changes to CITES to take a One Health approach, but institutionalize it, make it a part of the international legal framework. I think now's the time to do that, embed it in the institution, make sure governments and citizens do everything they can to avoid us uh, suffering the, the massive trauma uh, of these pandemics. Second last question, John. If we do not create an intervention that's a global intervention, are we going to see more wildlife related pandemics? Yeah, and this is about managing risk. And at the moment, we're at high risk because we're only looking at wildlife trade from an international perspective based on you know, conservation criteria. Will it result in overexploitation of that species? We're proceeding blind to the human and animal health implications there. So we really are exposing ourselves. We're exposing ourselves to the risk of future wildlife related pandemics associated with uh, unregulated or poor, poorly regulated trade. If we want to minimize that risk, we need a global effort here. It's not good enough that just one or two or three countries takes measures. We need a global effort because these things can emerge from multiple places around the globe. So a strong global effort is needed. We need to institutionalize it to minimize our risk of exposure to this spillover. If not, we're leaving it to informal arrangements. We're leaving it to uh, unilateral actions in different, in different countries. And these things tend to disappear over time. Our memories are short. So we really need to institutionalize this and make sure that we've got the right uh, structures and the right uh, laws in place to avoid these pandemics going forwards. And some of those elements, as you talked about, was the is illegal wildlife trade, is... Um, is stopping the uh, the efforts where wildlife trade directly impacts on human and animal health um, to close wildlife markets to stem consumption 
But then you also need collaboration from WHO, OIE, and FAO. How is those conversations going at the moment? So very well, and we also need collaboration with the UN Office of Drugs and Crime and the UN Convention Against Transnational Organised Crime because this is how we're going to take a, a stronger approach to dealing with wildlife crime and with these other institutions. So we are communicating directly with these other institutions. They are starting to talk much more effectively amongst themselves. And I think what there's an appetite for is how do we move beyond the discussion, move beyond putting in place, if you like, memorandums of cooperation and somehow embed this into the international legal framework so that we can be sure that these actions are taken in relation to illegal, regulated or unregulated trade so that we can be sure we've, uh, we're giving ourselves the best shot at avoiding finding ourselves in this uh, same situation into the future.